fit, formidable, and fantastic. This video is being created due to some responses from my What This Vegan Bodybuilder Eats in a Day video. Uh, these are items that I thought were worth clarifying as it might be informative for others. So let's get to it. First comment. Why do you consume so much of the mock meat? As I stated in my video, it is simply because of flexibility and to some degree taste a uh, variety in foods. My calories are currently limited uh, a bit due to the, my goals actually, and as such my fat and carb macros have taken a relative hit uh, while my protein is higher. And I've gone over protein needs before, especially in my orig original video response to uh, Richard titled uh, Meet Your Match, which I will link in the description below. And I've explored the entire recommended range of uh, protein for natural bodybuilders, from the lower end to about the middle to where I'm currently consuming. And where I'm currently at just works best for me, um, for how I look, how I perform, and how I feel. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to be the optimal amount for you, uh, even if you're a bodybuilder. The mock meats that I featured, especially the uh, Beyond Meat Veggie Strips and the Beyond Meat Beefy Crumbles, as they're called, and the Gardein Patties also, have similar macros to tofu, which is an, inc which is an incredibly flexible food in and of itself. Um, and since I don't always feel like consuming tofu each fucking day, uh, sometimes I'll vary it up by subbing in a mock meat, just to keep things interesting, uh, but not wreck my diet protocol in doing so. Um, foods like beans, for instance, are just too high in carbs for me to be able to make them work right now. Uh, really, it's just that simple. Flexibility. Next comment. Corey, can you make a video on your opinion of processed vegan food and mock meat? I love to add them into my diet, but I also feel guilty doing it because most, if not all, of it is labeled as vegan junk food in our community. Would love to get your take on it and what you would consider to be better brands on the market. Thank you. I don't really see them as a junk food. I see them as a valid and flexible source of high protein. Uh, but let me explain. Um, for their calories, they offer similar macros to tofu, which I had already mentioned. Uh, they're rich in protein, moderate in fat, and lowish in carbs. And as such, they are very flexible for a strict bodybuilder like myself. Uh, to me, junk would be something like cake, for instance. Cake is high in calories with incredible amounts of refined sugar and high amounts of fat, but little to no protein. Uh, so for my goals, cake would be empty in junk and a waste of calories and literally offer no sound way to really work into my diet without sacrificing overall quality of intake. Thus, cake is useless to my diet, and anything similar to cake um, would fall into that category. Uh, this is not the case as I described with mock meats. So I suppose it is very relative to your needs and goals and thus uh, casts influence over your personal opinion on the matter. Um, my way uh, is the right way for me, um, and where I'm at right now, and where I'm going right now, but I'm in no way saying that everyone should follow suit, and I emphasize this in my Day of Eating video. I prefer the Beyond Meat products because they utilize a pea protein, so some variety away from soy all the time as well, but I also like uh, Gardein. Um, at least the gluten-free soy-based uh, scallopini product, since I am sensitive to uh, gluten. So really, it's just a matter of personal preferences. Next comment. Is it safe to take so many scoops of protein? It is just an isolated macronutrient. Uh, in this case, the, the macro being protein. In the case of the blend I like, which is made from pea, rice, and soy protein sources, the supplier I use is a bulk supplier, um, you can customize down to the flavors, the sweeteners, etc. Or you can just have a plain blend of the protein sources too if you wish. So it's pretty much void of fillers that you'd find in a lot of average commercial store-bought products. Um, to put this in perspective, a 30 gram scoop of the blend that I use contains 25.7 grams of protein. That is approximately 86% protein per scoop. And there is a little fat and carb and fiber to consider as you cannot perfectly isolate the protein out. So that's relatively good, I would say. Um, it's actually better than Vega. 
um, which is one of the leading brands. So, granted, uh, protein powder is mostly void of other nutrients, and thus whole foods are incredibly superior, but if you're off in your protein needs, but on track with your fat and carbs, and you don't want to go over in those areas, protein powder is a valid option to hit a quota. You know, I see protein powder as a food source, uh, plain and simple. Um, it's not complete, as I said, but still it's providing uh, nutritional value on some level for a specific need. Um, my opinion on the matter is uh, to eat as much as you can from a whole foods, plant-based diet, um, all of your needs if you can, but if protein powder will help you with your specific goals, then why not? Um, are they necessary for everyone? Hell no. Uh, might some people benefit from them? Well, sure, I do. But don't copy me or anyone else. Do what you need to do for you. Anyway, next comment, and this is going to be a juicy one. Also, Vegan Gains always talks about how any type of protein powder increases risk for cancer. Okay, let's explore why. Protein as a nitrogenous compound contains BCAAs, which are three of the nine essential amino acids known collectively as branched-chain amino acids. They include leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, they are all essential in that your body must obtain them from diet. Um, leucine is the real culpr sorry, culprit here uh, for Richard's claims. So why is that? Leucine has been shown to regulate mTOR, or the mammalian target of rapamycin. And mTOR has been shown to promote cell growth and thus tumor cell motility and subsequently the spread of cancer. But what people need to understand is the difference between a transient and a longer lasting effect. While leucine may increase mTOR activity, the effect is transient when it comes to diet. In other words, it would spike during and after the meal but decline as time passes from the meal. Even hypertrophy-induced weight training can raise mTOR, but again, it is a transient effect. Much like the positive effects on testosterone and growth hormone from weight training. Which, as demonstrated in research, are both spiked, but declined to baseline within 30 minutes of performance. Despite their acute increases during performance, thus while heavy fucking squats may raise your test levels, you simply won't enjoy steroid-like gains from them. The effect is not long-lasting enough. It is transient. Thus, it is not com comparable to injecting uh, exogenous testosterone and keeping your levels spiked continuously. But back to mTOR. It exists in our bodies for a purpose, and it does aid in the building of muscle tissue. So don't fear transient increases, and don't fear protein intake for your goals. Let's not exaggerate and demonize here. Uh, that is how fear-mongering starts. mTOR is important in the adaptive response that makes us bigger, stronger, and healthier as a result of exercise. But there's more to leucine influencing Richard's advice than just mTOR upregulation. Leucine also increases IGF-1 levels, or insulin-like growth factor 1. IGF-1, according to a Harvard article, may contribute to the growth of tumors. What's the matter? Oh, I have a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor! But it is also a necessary hormone in our bodies during our life cycle. In fact, that same article elaborates that it is necessary for proper growth in children. But do clue into some key elements here. There is a possibility that IGF-1 contributes to the growth of tumors, but not a guarantee. Correlation exists at best. As demonstrated by the research on nurses and physicians discussed in that Harvard article. But correlation does not imply causation. Let's circle back to my previous talk of transient versus lasting effects. You see, while leucine can spike endogenous IGF-1 production, the effect is transient, temporary, and not the same as injecting exogenous IGF-1, which would cause levels to remain in a consistently raised state. What I would like to see, either from future research or anything existing, which I may not have reviewed yet, is how much protein, or leucine specifically, is required to raise either mTOR and IGF-1 with any significance, the key word there being significance. Moreover, how much is required within a specific time frame for that increase to put one into the 
at-risk range for cancerous growth, proliferation, and motility. And even furthermore, how long that increase from protein intake remains within a risky range before it drops below and to baseline. Uh, and I would like to see this research on the human model, um, not the rodent model or any other subject with a differing biology. For now, I will conclude, and you can take it or leave it as you see fit, that no one should fear ample protein intake for your goals, assuming that you have such goals worth considering a higher level of protein intake, say, versus the average person's recommended daily needs. Uh, to recover sufficiently from muscle tissue breakdown inherent with intense weight training, for instance. Nor would I fear temporary effects on mTOR or IGF-1, both of which play beneficial roles in the human body. And in the end, it's all about choices anyway, calculated risks, if you will. Uh, we all die eventually, so we might as well enjoy the things we love and achieve our goals while we're here, insofar as that these goals and their inherent requirements are only affecting our individual health and bodies and not infringing on other beings external to ourselves. So always be as healthy as you can to enjoy what you love as long as possible, but I would never advise someone to sacrifice their dreams and goals altogether just because they're afraid of what might be and in doing so hold themselves back uh, there's just nothing fantastic about living your life in fear, uh, in cowering, especially from something like protein intake. Uh, anyhow, I don't have anything else to elaborate on any of these matters. I hope this has been enlightening uh, as an episode, and hopefully it's alleviated or at least offered some perspective on some of the fears circulating around. As always, do feel free to drop your thoughts in the comments below, and until next time, my friends, take care.